Please join with me in turning in God's Word to the book of Daniel. Daniel found in the Old Testament among the prophets just after the major prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and just before all what we call the minor prophets who have the funny names that are hard to pronounce uh, there towards the end of the Old Testament. The book of Daniel, we're going to begin a, a series of messages this fall uh, through this book and through uh, the story of Daniel and his friends and, and God's people as they are in exile in Babylon. And so we will begin that today, looking at Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Let's give our attention now to hear God's word. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. And then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. There were to be, they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. And among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Let's pray together. Father, would you give your blessing on the reading and hearing and now the teaching of your word. Lord, come. Make the word live to us. Make the word live in us. Speak boldly through your humble servant. In my weakness, would you show yourself strong? And Lord, would you do your work of transforming us more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus, as we see you, as we believe you, as we walk faithfully with you, just as your people have done. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Excuse me a moment. Getting something caught in my throat here. <clears throat> How do you view and respond to what is happening in the world? Particularly when what is happening in the world suddenly has very direct impact and implications on you and your life. How do you handle major change? Particularly when that change suddenly disrupts or threatens to shake the very foundations of what you believe and how you live. We've all experienced that at different times. Some of us, many of us experienced that 20 years ago on that September morning when terrorist attacks went from something that you just read about as isolated incidents in faraway countries to something that suddenly hit home on a major scale and changed how we view things, how we live in very significant ways. Certainly we are experiencing a time like that now when a, when a global pandemic has fundamentally changed the, uh, and altered almost every aspect of our lives, has really caused us to, to have questions and, and it's presented challenges that, that really get down to the very core of, of our, our being and, and what we believe and who we can trust. 
As Christians, we more and more see our brothers and sisters in various places around the world living under repressive regimes, under intense persecution, under pressure to to renounce their faith and and being more and more marginalized and, and displaced and even killed for what they believe. And even in our own rapidly changing society, the pressures upon believers to be conformed to the patterns of this world to, and a worldview that is increasingly hostile towards God, the God of the Bible, and towards His people is growing such that the cost of faithfully following Jesus is increasing significantly. How do we view and how do we live when that begins to happen to us, or when it happens just in our personal life, when, when some difficulty or struggle uh, hits us personally and it radically changes and challenges our faith, changes our life and challenges our faith. How do we view and live in a rapidly changing world where even though our experience of hardship and hostility may not be as extreme as we see in other places, Nevertheless, we're more and more confronted that as believers, we are living as aliens. We are living as strangers in this world, exiles in a land that is not our home. Where the pressure to increasingly conform, to be shaped more and more by the ways and values of the world around us than by the word of the God who has redeemed us are, are always growing. How do we trust the faithfulness of God and how do we live faithfully for God in the midst of a world and a life that is increasingly a place where we feel the, the bitterness of pain, where we feel the, and experience the brokenness of sin and evil, where we sense alienation and a, and a greater longing for, for uh, our home, our ultimate home. Well, to answer that question, we're going to turn to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel teaches us through the experience of God's people in exile and particularly of of that of Daniel and, and his three friends about the God who is sovereign over all the major events of history as well as over the minute details of our individual lives and who is faithful to guard his people and to guide them to have faith in and, and be faithful to him as we are living under the threat and pressures of a world that is ultimately not our home. So as we enter into our study of this book this fall, I want to begin this week just by giving a brief overview of the context of the book and then looking at the, at the overarching themes of the book in terms of Daniel's circumstances, Daniel's confidence in those circumstances, and Daniel's character as they relate to the book as a whole. As we read back in 2 Kings, the book of Daniel takes place during the time when God's people were conquered by and they were exiled to Babylon beginning around 605 B.C. and and taking place in a series of stages over the next 20 years and lasting for about 70 years. And in order to to have a little bit more background, you may remember that, that back in Genesis, God had called Abraham out of the land of Ur, which was in fact, in the area of Babylonia, to a a land that he would show him. And Abraham obeyed God, and God covenanted with Abraham to make him the father of a great nation and to bless all the world through his descendants. And so God's people, the people of Israel, were established. And after being enslaved in Egypt for some 400 years, God delivered them through the hand of Moses, whom he gave his law, and he, he promised to bring them to the land that he had promised to Abraham. And you'll remember Israel hadn't even started that journey to the land before they were grumbling against God. They were, they were breaking His commandments and being unfaithful to His covenant. But God was faithful in that. And as they entered the land, He reminded them that, that they were to be faithful to follow Him, to follow His commands, and to live under His authority. And they... He would, if, as they did, he, they would be blessed. But if they turned away from Him, if they walked away from His ways, He promised, even in Deuteronomy, before they entered the land, that He would deliver them into the hand of a foreign nation and they would serve other gods. Well, for the next 
700 years, Israel went through an ever-growing cycle of of rebellion and, and leadership under various kings, some of whom were faithful, some of whom were not. And God repeatedly warned them through the prophets, through Isaiah, through Jeremiah and others, until finally He fulfilled His promise of judgment by bringing first the Assyrians and then ultimately the Babylonians upon the kingdom of Judah. And in 605, as we read, Nebuchadnezzar began a series of attacks and sieges upon Jerusalem that resulted in the overthrow of King Jehoiakim. And then a process of of bringing out the people and ultimately destroying Jerusalem and exiling God's people back into Babylon, which took place in 586. Daniel and his friends were among the very first exiles at the beginning in 605, which is where we see the account begin here in Daniel chapter 1. Now as we go through the book of Daniel, it is divided into two equal parts. The first six chapters are historical narrative that that chronicles several events in the life of Daniel and his friends that, that both challenge as well as strengthen their faith and demonstrate God's continued faithfulness to them and to His people. And the last six chapters contain visions and dreams that God gives to Daniel that point to to God's future dealing with various nations and the coming Messiah who would establish the dominion of God's kingdom. And oftentimes, it's those last six chapters that we get caught up in and that cause all kind of, of issues for us. And we'll take time to look at those as we get there. But they help place all of history, including our own age, into perspective into the perspective of God's sovereign reign and purpose towards which all of history is moving. And so we'll be looking at those in the weeks ahead. And I want to encourage you to take some time to read the book as a whole. But for the rest of the time this morning, I want to point in the early verses that we read in chapter 1, I want to point out three overarching themes that are touched on and will be prominent throughout the book. And as I mentioned, I want to look at them in terms of Daniel's circumstances, his confidence, and his character. First, let's look at Daniel's circumstances. It's obviously one of radically changing times. Jerusalem, the very city of God, the place of of God's temple, and the center of, of all of the worship of Judah, is overthrown and delivered into the hands of a foreign king along with King Jehoiakim. It's besieged by Nebuchadnezzar. And if ever there was a time of political and cultural and spiritual upheaval in the life of God's people, this was the big one. This was the big one. Suddenly Daniel, just a young man, not much older than than many of, of you young folks in the congregation here, probably around 15 or 16 years old. Having grown up in the faith, having been taught the Word of God and the ways of God, living in a nation ruled by that Word and and those ways, finds himself forcibly removed from his home and his parents, taken literally as a prisoner of war, and carried off to a foreign land hundreds of miles away. And not just him, but many of the people of Judah along with him. And there he would enter into the world of the most prosperous, most advanced, most powerful nation at that time under the leadership of a thoroughly pagan king. And he would be prepared and trained to serve as one of the top advisors in that administration. Needless to say, Daniel, as well as all of God's people taken into exile, found themselves now on the outside looking in. Suddenly they were removed from everything that was familiar to them. And as we see, they will, they will face significant challenges to their faith as they sought to live as aliens and strangers in these conditions. And there was this sense going on in their mind of how can this be? How can God allow this to happen? Where is God in all of this? Everywhere they turn, they face the threat and the temptation to compromise and conform to the world and the culture around them. They would face pressure to compromise their beliefs, laws that they 
could not in good conscience obey. They would live under and serve administrations and kings who not only did not share their worldview of faith or faith, but who sought to undermine it, sought to exalt themselves, sought to lift themselves up in the place of God. Surely they found themselves wondering if indeed God had abandoned them or or if their God was truly as powerful as they had seen and heard in their lives. That's reflected in the statement there in verse 2 that was not only that not only was Jehoiakim delivered into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, but the very vessels of the temple of the house of God were taken away and placed in the temple of the Babylonian gods. To the people of Judah, it appeared that not only had their king been conquered, their city been destroyed, but their God had been defeated and himself given over to the gods of the enemy. It's hard to imagine how unsettling and uprooting this change was. And yet, we know what it's like to live in rapidly changing times. We know what it's like to live in a culture that is increasingly in conflict with God and His Word and more and more of a challenge to the faith of God's people. Indeed, God's people have always lived in those kind of times. Things that we thought were unthinkable 40 years ago from the standpoint of the, of the cultural and political and even spiritual fabric of our nation are now not only permitted but promoted. To hold a biblical worldview on various matters is, is now seen not just as radical, but even as revolutionary and is on the verge of being considered intolerable and maybe even at some point impermissible. And one of the main points of Daniel is to show us, both through the experience of Daniel and his friends, as well as through the, the, the vision God gives to Daniel of the future is that earthly rulers and earthly kingdoms will come and go. Kingdoms will rise and fall. Cultures will prosper and decline. And God's people will find themselves living in the midst of all of it. Nebuchadnezzar's victory over Jerusalem was just one small jewel in his crown of conquest. Babylon was a world-class city and the most powerful empire in the world in its day. And yet, in chapter 4, We'll see Nebuchadnezzar basking in the pride of, of the great Babylon and he takes credit for building it and, and declares it all for his glory. But God will humble Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel will outlast not just him, but several other rulers and would see the great Babylon fall into the hands of the Medes and the Persians. And not only did Daniel experience such changing kingdoms and cultures, but Daniel also saw it on a much larger scale. As God reveals through through Nebuchadnezzar's dreams and other visions, the rise and fall of future kingdoms and the ultimate victory and dominion of God's kingdom. All of this was at the time to, 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 to put the time for the exiles into perspective for the people of Israel by pointing to the fleeting nature of worldly earthy, earthly kings and kingdoms and the eternal enduring nature of God's sovereign rule over all things. So Daniel and his friends and, and God's people and, and even us today find ourselves living in changing times, living in, in, as exiles, as aliens and strangers in rapidly and constantly shifting circumstances and culture that has been on confusing and conforming us to its views. And as we'll see, it often can be enticing, can be attractive. How do we see God's faithfulness? How do we remain faithful ourselves in the midst of those kind of circumstances? Well, if Daniel's circumstances were one of changing times and changing culture, then we see that his confidence is one of an unchanging God who is indeed sovereign over all. The opening verses of Daniel's book not only give us an account of the historical situation of Nebuchadnezzar's siege and the conquering of Jerusalem, but they also let us in on the, on the theological reality behind all that is happening. Look at verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar along with some of the vessels from the house of God. In stark contrast 
to the, to the changing rulers and kings of this world is the unchanging sovereignty and rule of the Lord our God. The only power and authority that Nebuchadnezzar has is that which is given to him by God. And Daniel knows this. He knows this because it's been spoken of before in God's Word. It was predicted by the prophets. It was given to God's people as a warning. And he knows that God is sovereign over even these things, such that he begins his prayer over in chapter 2, verse 20. Blessed be the name of, the God, of God forever and ever, to whom belongs all wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets kings up. He gives wisdom to the wise. We see... In Daniel, God's sovereignty over the changing rule and reign of various nations. And over the hearts of kings. In chapter 4, we'll see God humble a proud Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 5, we'll see him reveal to Belshazzar where the vessels of God's house are being used for a drunken feast that Belshazzar is not sovereign. And indeed, on that very night, his rule would be overthrown and his life taken from him. Later on, King Darius as well will come to see God's sovereign hand to deliver his people. In the midst of the revolving door of, of changing kings and kingdoms, of different circumstances and pressures, God continually reveals in powerful ways that their kingdoms will end, but his will not. In fact, Daniel will be given a powerful vision of the Lord seated on his throne in the everlasting dominion of his kingdom, given to one like the Son of Man, a prophecy that we now know was fulfilled by Jesus, who himself would say to the Roman governor, Pilate, who was about to, to sentence him to death, you have no authority over me except what has been given by God. God's kingdom is not of this world, but it is always over this world. And it's significant that Daniel tells us the vessels of the house of God were brought back to the land of Shinar, to the house of Nebuchadnezzar's God. Do you recognize that name, Shinar? It was the place in, in Genesis 11 where the peoples of the earth gathered together, where they, where they came together and sought to build the Tower of Babel as a monument of their own ingenuity and, and achievement and to the glory of their name. It was to be a symbol of man's rule apart from God and the glory of man's kingdom. And you remember what God did. He confused their language. He scattered them abroad across the earth, bringing a, a swift end to their ambitious project. And here God allows the vessels of His temple to be taken back to the land of Shinar as if to set up another, another showdown between the illusory greatness of man's kingdom and power over against God's eternal and sovereign rule. Nebuchadnezzar assumed that his victory over Jerusalem was a vindication that his God was mightier than the God of Israel. But God would not have that. And once again, as we'll see over and over, he will prove his might and his power over the kingdoms of man. But in the meantime, he sins and he calls his people to, to faithfulness and to trust in his sovereignty. Even when it may appear that he is, is not present or at work, God proves faithful in his promise and his word to judge the rebellion of his people. The very thing that is happening is proving that God is faithful to His Word. And it is His hand that delivers King Jehoiakim and the vessels of His house and His people into exile in the land of Babylon. And it will be His hand that delivers them out of and delivers us out of our exile apart from Him. God is not absent but indeed is very present in the trials and struggles that we find ourselves engaged in. And His faithfulness is seen even in His judgment upon His own people for their sin and rebellion. If you think about it, God here is willing to suffer even the reproach of His own name for a time 
in order to demonstrate the seriousness with which he takes his, his covenant and the holiness of his people and his care and his love for them. But he will always be faithful to vindicate himself and his people as we trust in his sovereign power over all things and his promise of deliverance to those whose faith is in him. And so Daniel's confidence in the midst of ever-changing time was the, the unchanging nature and the sovereignty of a God who is faithful to his promises, both in judgment as well as in deliverance, which is ultimately what enabled Daniel and his friends to live faithfully as exiles in an ungodly world. We see that in Daniel's character as an uncompromising servant. The first thing Nebuchadnezzar did when he brought Daniel and the other exiles back from Jerusalem was to immediately start to conform them to their new culture and their new belief system. And we'll look more at this next week as we deal with the rest of this chapter, but, but this was a proactive, this was an intentional effort to change their identity, to change their worldview, to fit them into the mold in every way of the, of the new kingdom and the new king under whom they would serve. They were given new names. They were taught a, a, a new language. They were educated from a new perspective. They were servants to the king and they would have every incentive and every opportunity to, to compromise and to abandon their faith in God in order to fit into their new circumstances. Sound familiar? It's happening all around us. It's happening in us. Even now. But for Daniel and his friends, compromise was not an option. Despite the threat to their positions, their reputations, even their very lives, on the things that matter. Trusting in God's Word. Obedience to God's will. Confidence in God's, God's sovereignty and His power and His goodness. Daniel and his friends would remain uncompromising. And yet, while he would stand firm in faith and remain uncompromising in character, he also recognized that God had a purpose and a plan for the position he found himself in. And therefore, he would seek to live as a testimony to God's faithfulness, even in a faithless culture. So he engaged in faithful service with a humble heart. As we'll see Daniel didn't start a Twitter campaign against the king and all his policies. He did not foster angry rhetoric or stage protests or form the Jerusalem Resistance Party to mount opposition to the situation. He trusted God. He prayed fervently. He spoke the truth as God revealed it to him and he did it with respect and even at times with compassion. He sought to serve as he could to bring godly influence and wisdom to bear upon the, the place and the people to whom God had positioned him to serve, even if it was an utterly godless environment. Daniel becomes for us in many ways a model of patience and perseverance and uncompromising faith in the midst of adverse and difficult circumstances. But the book is not about Daniel. And it's not about us just daring to be a Daniel, even though there are many ways we should emulate and we'll see how we can walk as Daniel and his friends did. The book is about God. A sovereign, powerful God who works even through the exile and, and judgment of His people to magnify His name, to show Himself powerful and to bring about the deliverance of His people which He had promised from the beginning and which He ultimately fulfills in His Son, Jesus Christ. As Daniel sought and trusted God, God gives Daniel and his friends the resources and the wisdom to not just survive, but to make a difference and even thrive in a foreign land. And God's deliverances in his life gave Daniel the hope that in the end, God would indeed fulfill His promise of greater deliverance for His people. And brothers and sisters, you and I have seen that greater deliverance. God has been faithful to His promises. And He sent one greater than Daniel, 
Indeed, He sent Himself in the person of His only Son to be, in a sense, exiled into a world of sin and rebellion and to give Himself up, to to literally enter into the house of the God of this world to bear the sin and the reproach of His own people in order that God's power over sin and death and His deliverance into the everlasting kingdom of His glory and grace would be assured for all who stand firm in faith in His sovereign grace in the midst of suffering. Jesus came to reveal a sovereign and good God in the flesh. And God has not left us in exile. And even today, He is with us and He is for us and He will deliver us as we live trusting in His unchanging faithfulness and sovereignty in the midst of suffering, in the midst of changing times, And as we pursue uncompromising faithfulness through prayer and through His Word and obedience to His ways, as we pursue God's wisdom and seek to live as His witnesses and ambassadors amidst the ever-changing circumstances of our lives, God promises that He is with us and that He is working for us. So how do you view and respond to what is happening in the world? particularly when what is happening in the world more and more confronts and challenges your life, your beliefs as a follower of Christ? How do you face and live as a, as a stranger in a foreign land where it may seem that God has been sidelined or He's been relegated to some back room among the temple and the idols of this world? The book of Daniel is meant to speak to give hope and courage and confidence to God's people in the midst of those changing and and shifting and, and hard circumstances that He is in control. No matter what happens or who appears to be in charge, God is sovereignly on His throne and He is working His will and His purpose for His people. He's the one who sets up kings and presidents and world leaders and He's the one who removes them. He does not just allow, but He promises that in this world, we will have trouble. We we still live in a world where we suffer the consequences of sin and rebellion and, and in our life in a world of sickness and pain and trials. And God uses even godless pagan rulers and regimes to bring about His purposes and plans of judgment and redemption for His people. And the book of Daniel reminds us again that God always wins. And it points us to the means by which He does so in sending His Son, the King of Kings, who entered into this world, who lived a life of perfect obedience, uncompromising faith and trust in the will of His Heavenly Father, who entered in not just with us, but He entered in for us to the fiery furnace and the the den of, of death for our sin against the Lord. And in Jesus' resurrection, He spares us that judgment that we might now live confident in the the grace and the power of our unchanging God and, and living faithfully as His witnesses in the kingdoms of this world. You see, our citizenship is with Christ in heaven. And because we know the King of kings, because we know the sovereign God of the universe, We can trust Him. and We can seek from Him in prayer the wisdom, the courage, the grace we need. And He promises to give that to us. Everything we need for life and godliness in this world. And so whatever your circumstances are now, wherever you are feeling exiled, alienated, tempted or tried, pressured to conform or be conformed, or despairing in the midst of the, of the struggle of the battle. Remember, God is on His throne. You're not going through anything that He is not working and purposing for your good in Christ and for your deliverance in His kingdom. God is sovereign over all things and He is faithful to His promises. And He has fulfilled those promises of deliverance through His Son, the King of Kings. To trust Him 
to commune with him in prayer and in his word, to worship him and him alone and to live for him that others may, may come to, to know him and to enter into fellowship with him. That is the calling of God upon his people as we live as exiles and strangers in this world. And as we walk together through this book in the coming months, let us remember that the God of Daniel, the God of, of Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah is the same God who is with us and who delivers us and whom we serve through the power of His Son Jesus by His Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, you are the sovereign ruler of all things. And we come and we humble ourselves before you again, before your word. And we give you thanks, O oh God, that even as you delivered your people and Daniel and his friends into circumstances and into situations in a, in a culture that was so foreign and so radically opposed to all that they knew and all that they had been raised to know. But God, you are faithful and you are sovereign over all. And as we see that manifested in, in their lives and in the lives of your people and as we recognize that your deliverance has been fulfilled through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, would you keep us faithful? Would you remind us in these days when there seems to be much chaos and confusion in our world, in our communities, even in our own hearts, Lord, that you are an unchanging God and that your purposes will stand firm and that nothing as we heard earlier that comes against us can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus and so where there are those here this morning Lord who are who are struggling who are feeling pressured to conform to abandon things that they know to be true to question your goodness or even your presence or your power to work in the midst of difficulty and suffering. Father, would you encourage their hearts? Would you help them to see who you are and what you have done and what you continue to do? And Lord, give us the hope that one day all these things all the brokenness, all the sin, all the tears, all the struggles that we face, Lord, will be removed. And your kingdom will stand forever. And we will stand with you in it. And Lord, for those who may be here, who continue to be alienated and estranged from you, who perhaps are still living for themselves or for the kingdoms of this world or for the things that this world has to offer, I pray, Father, that you would draw them to yourself. Lord, give eyes to see that there is no God but you who rules and reigns and who is welcoming and drawing sinners to yourself through your Son, Jesus. Lord, would you draw us to yourself? And would you help us to walk in the newness of life and by faith and trust in you and in your word? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.